Let me jump in there with Brian and uh, also thank you for your faithfulness and your giving. I mean, you really do give us an opportunity to share this message with more and more people. And I know there are people even now that you're involved in being uh, hosting a watch party or uh, trying to expand the, uh, the viewership of this message as we present the gospel. And we're so grateful for the work that you are doing uh, even online uh, right now. We're gonna talk this morning about uh, your heart monitor. Now, if you're like me, you have a lot of monitors. Uh, in fact, I just got a notice that the electric company wants to switch my meter to a meter that they can monitor more readily all the time, I guess through a satellite signal or something like that, because that's sort of a, a part of our life. Uh, I have a blood pressure um, little piece that I put on my arm and it's wireless and it talks to my phone. And not only will it tell me my blood pressure, but it will monitor my, the rhythms of my heart. I'm like, wow, this, is, this little thing can tell me whether or not my heart is in correct rhythm or I have some sort of uh, arrhythmia or some sort of uh, issue that I need to deal with. We're, we're all looking for and all interested in things that help us monitor our our health in life. So your heart uh, needs a monitor also. And I'm not just talking about the physical part of your heart, but the, the part of your heart that really is uh, attached to the way you think, uh, attached to uh, your emotions, your feelings. The Bible says this in the Old Testament. It says, guard your heart with all diligence for out of it flow the issues, the things of life. And, it, and it's true. In other words, you and I are guided so much by uh, not just uh, what's available or, or, or just uh, some of the uh, temporary emotions or things in our life, but we're guarded by what our heart decides to go after and our heart decides to uh, chase in life. Uh, when Joni and I when we got married, uh, one of the exciting things when you get married is, of course, to go off on your uh, honeymoon, and we were very excited. And there was certainly a, a, a romantic aspect to our uh, honeymoon, which just to let you know, I, I sort of messed up right after the wedding uh, because I, as we pulled out and as we left and all the people are, you know, throwing rice that they used to do and things like that uh, at you, we drive off. Uh, I pulled into a car wash because some of my friends had written on my car with you know, some of those markers that you can put on the glass and whatever. And I, just to let you know, my wife did not think that was romantic at all. She thought, we're doing what? I said, well, I have to get this off the paint because what if it ruins the paint? The, the car's gonna be sitting in a parking lot you know, for a week or 10 days while we are gone. And I, so I didn't start it off very well. But as we went on our honeymoon, we went to Hawaii, uh, which was a wonderful treat for us. And you have this you know, new, um, romance, this new intimacy that's there. And so we sort of planned, as you do in your honeymoon, uh, every night to have a special time together, some sort of romantic um, dinner and encounter. And, and like a lot of newlyweds, we went on with this for a while until I think it was, I think it was her because she's more of the one to take charge uh, on a lot of things like that than I am. I think it was her when we got back uh, to Houston and this, we were trying to continue this every day because you know we had this idea that it would always be this way. She just said, can we take a break? <laughs> and I, I was more than willing. I was like, yes, you know, I was just trying to get permission that it was, that it was okay that we didn't have to act like this all the time, that there was, there was going to be more, you know, to our relationship, we hoped, than, than just this part of our relationship. And of course, you know, it, it was, and, um, and there were more things to it. And that, that's a good thing. You know, when you get older, if, if you're around, you know, your parents or your grandparents and, you know, of course, it's, you know, can be really uh, sort of gross to hear that there was uh, romance in their lives at one time. You're like, what? Oh, don't want to even hear about that. You, you will also notice that they will sometimes make jokes about those times in their lives. And they will kind of look back on them, you know, uh, saying things or making jokes about it. You know, and that's, that's because they, they grew up and they realized there was more to our love and our relationship than just those times. Those were an expression of it. And um, they were a very exclusive expression of it, but it, it wasn't what the relationship was really all about. So here's the question I wanna ask you to get you to think about um, today. How do you monitor your heart? How are you gonna know whether or not your heart is on the right track 
or whether or not you're just doing things or going through some motions and there really might be some real heart problems that you're going through that you aren't addressing yet. And if you don't address, one day, you know, you're gonna have to deal with those things and they could, be, they could be very difficult to deal with if you put them off too long or you wait too long, you know, before um, and wait, you know, to a point where you cannot deal with them. So how do you monitor uh, your heart? And I want you to uh, look with me. Some of these verses will pop up on your uh, screen. This is uh, 1 Corinthians chapter number 12. This is a letter. Uh, that Paul writes uh, two letters, actually 1 Corinthians and 2 Corinthians, uh, very lengthy. Just to put it in context, uh, in the Bible, uh, the Corinthians, a very wealthy place, very uh, powerful people. It would have been one of the in places uh, to live. Um, these people were uh, talented, uh, they were well educated, and they were certainly proud of all those things not without reason. Those are, those were really good things. It was a really great place to live, but the tendency or the, or the, I guess the uh, temptation is to look at those things and say, that's the most important thing of, in life. And then somehow in doing that to neglect even your own heart and where your heart is going. And this was certainly the reason, or one of the major reasons that Paul wrote these letters to the Corinthians uh, trying to help correct them and trying to lead them uh, in a different way. And at one point, Paul puts out a, a wonderful several chapters on the purpose of the church and um, the members of the church and the giftedness of the church and how we are all different. And he goes on and says this in chapter number 12, beginning with verse 27. He says, now you are Christ's body. Now this is a, a metaphor. Uh, so we are physically those who belong to Jesus Christ on this earth. So we're like the physical body of Jesus as we live in, on this earth. And he lives in one sense through us. He says, and you're individually members of it. So even though we are individuals and we're all different and we take on different roles and different functions, we are part of the same body, um, a part of Jesus. And he says in verse 28, and God has appointed in the church first apostles, second, prophets, third, teachers, then miracles, then gifts of healings, helps, administrations, and various kinds of tongues. Now, Paul is very specific in giving some sort of order to these things. And more than likely, um, he's doing this because he knows this is one of the things they struggle with. In other words, emphasizing the things that are not as important as if they were the most important things. And if you look at that list, I know that that may be strange for us because it's not uh, language or um, gifts that we think of in, in modern life, but in the church, this has always been a part of who we are. And, um, and these are the things that have to do with God's purpose in using us in reaching a world. So he lists them in some sort of order so that they would understand that there is an importance there. But then he goes on and, and he says this in the next verse, verse 29. He says, all are not apostles, are they? Even though he says that's the number one gift. He says, uh, all are not prophets, are they? All are not teachers, are they? All are not workers of miracles, even though that would certainly be a more um, showy gift. If you could walk around and do miracles, I mean, most of us would say, yeah, I'll take that one. I mean, because it would make me very important. Um, all do not have the gift of healings, do they? All do not speak with tongues. That would mean unknown languages, do they? All are not uh, interpreters. They do not interpret, do they? He says, but earnestly desire the greater gifts. Now, there are two ways in the, in the language that you could take that statement that he says, earnestly desire the greater gifts. One would be that you would say that Paul is saying, look to the ones that he ranked as the highest and say, those are the gifts that you should desire. Just to, going to tell you, there's a problem with that because he's been teaching that the gifts are given according to the Spirit's desire. God desires and the Spirit of God gives those gifts 
We don't go and claim those gifts or cause those to happen. All of these are things that he desires and he gives so that the body would function as a whole. It would be able to, to, to function together, which means you have to have different gifts and different, different uh, things uh, in the body. So that would be one way of interpreting it. Um, that, so you should chase after those gifts, even though I would say that uh, there's, there would be some question to interpreting it that way in its context. The other way to interpret it is to say, he is saying you want the very best. Your desire is for the very best things. And we would all say, yeah, sure. I'm a person, right? <laughs> That's the way we are. We, we want the very best things. In the, in the Greek, this word for desire is usually used in that sort of connotation, this particular word. So it, it, would, it would make sense that he is saying, that is your desire, but I'm gonna help you even though this is your desire in understanding some things that you need to understand that are even better. And then you would see, if, if you understood it that way, uh, maybe this next sentence in that same verse would make more sense. He goes on to say, and I show you a still more excellent way so he, he's going to say, Here, here's God's way. Here's how God plans things. Here's how God does things. And, and even though you might have a desire that would go a different direction, to go and to look at God's heart and God's desire and God's plan would be really important. In fact, to be able to monitor your own heart and your own desire based on God's desire would be really important as far as the help of your heart since God is even in individually trying to shape all of us with his heart, with his, with his character characteristics. So a couple of things that I think kind of jump uh, out with uh, in this passage already that Paul is talking about as far as monitoring your heart. First one, I would say this, be honest, and aware of potential distractions in your life. And this is what he's doing to them. He's pointing out, here's some distractions. Here's some things that might get you and your heart to go the wrong direction or to go a different direction. Not that we wouldn't all understand that and not that we wouldn't all say, yeah, I've done this before, but, but it's not the best way. And so he says, I'm gonna show you a better way. The second thing is, I think that he is absolutely pointing out how good accountability is. How, how important it is to have accountability with other people. You certainly have this in a marriage, there's an accountability there. Because in that accountability, in any relationship, in any group, the accountability helps you to stay on the right track. For someone to come back and say, look, I don't want you to go down this road because you won't like where it ends up. This is a better way to go, better understanding. And this is exactly, exactly what Paul is doing for them. This is his role. This is, this is part of his purpose uh, to do this uh, for this, this group, for this church. And so he is writing with his very purpose in mind. Then this is what it says beginning in 1 Corinthians uh, chapter 13, verse 1. Uh, this is called the great love chapter. And as you uh, read this one with me, you're going to notice uh, very poetic. As many scholars have said, this is the, the height of Paul's literary uh, con constructs. I mean, he's put together something that is so beautiful in its language and in its concept, and, and that's why it's called the, the great love chapter. And just to let you know, it appears in the midst of this struggle, you know, as a lot of times really good things do, in the midst of the need that is there. In Paul's case, uh, in the, the need for correction so that they remain healthy before God the way they should. And so this is what he says. He says this, he's going to give three sort of um, circumstances uh, in these first three verses. He says, first of all, if I could speak all the languages of earth and angels, so he's referring back to gifts, right? But didn't love others. He said, I would only be a noisy gong or a clanging cymbal. Second, if I had the gift of prophecy, and if I understood all of God's secret plans and possessed all knowledge, and if I had such faith that I could move mountains, but didn't love others, I would be nothing. Verse number three, if I gave everything I have to the poor, even sacrifice my body, this is, this is a combination of sacrifice and, and even martyrdom, which would seem the highest of human ideals that if you could give up your life in this way. He, um, he goes on to say, um, I could boast about it, 
But if I didn't love others, I would have gained nothing. So there's a reason Paul is pointing this out because in their city, um, sort of like maybe like churches, you know, we have music and someone would say, well, I like that church because it has the best music. Uh, they had uh, temples to gods that were there and they had music in their form of it. And they even had large gongs, right? They go, it was the early form of golf, you know, kind of the way some people I know play golf, you know, and, and you would say, boy, that temple and that God must be really powerful because just listen to the sound of that symbol or that gong or the, of the music that is made. And all of us would say, yeah, I understand that. I mean, let's, let's face it. Sometimes your favorite musical group growing up was not necessarily the best people be honest. Sometimes the things that you're attracted to as far as music is concerned, you might look at that, listen to that and say, yeah, but the words, yeah, I don't agree with the words. In fact, the words could be really destructive sometimes, but there's an attraction that is there. And, and so, so Paul is kind of equating this to some of the gifts that they have. And he says, that, listen, if you think that's the most important thing, what, what can happen is you're just chasing after that, something that may be symbolic or it may have some value to it, but it could distract you. And it, and it could cause you to be deceived and to miss the most important things. And what does he already point out as the most important thing? But I didn't love others. Yeah, my goodness. So, so without this connection to other people, without this love and care for other people, what Paul is already saying is there's something wrong with the heart because that's what the heart was designed for. It was not just designed to love me. The, the heart was designed with this capacity to love and to care for other people and to love and to care for God. And, and John will later come on and say, hey, look, if you, can, if you want to say, but I love and I care for God, but I don't love and care for people, he says, there's something missing in those steps. You need to be honest. And then he goes on and he talks about um, knowledge, understanding, prophecy, wisdom, because those would be things that, that most of us would say, yeah, that would be a really important thing and a really powerful thing to have in life. And uh, certainly the Corinthians were that way. There's no doubt that, that we are that way as a, as a culture and as a people. But he says, look, you can be deceived by those things. You can think those things are, are so good and are so important that it doesn't matter whether or not I care for other people. Or even uh, he goes to the ultimate, that, you know, that you could sacrifice yourself, you could give yourself up, which, which would be seeming to be the highest sense of, of no love for yourself. But he said, but if you do that, and don't love other people, he, he said, it's not a good trade-off. He said, it would accomplish nothing. If, if the whole point of you self-sacrificing was only to bring attention to yourself and lift yourself up, it, no one would gain from it. Nothing good would be done from it. It wouldn't make any long-term positive impact as far as people are concerned. Then he goes on to, uh, he goes on to say uh, this, verse number four. Love is patient. Love is kind. Love is not jealous. It's not boastful. It's not proud or rude. Love does not demand its own way. It is not irritable. Love keeps no record of being wronged. It does not rejoice about injustice, but rejoices whenever the truth wins out. Love never gives up. Love never loses faith. Love is always hopeful. It always endures through every circumstances. I mean, Paul is just lifting up love from God's perspective, God's kind of love. He, he is lifting up the, the supremacy as far as life is concerned of real genuine love in our lives, which is, if you listen to and read through his descriptions again, is all focused outside of us on someone else, not on ourselves. In fact, the sacrifice is of ourselves. So I would say the third thing, if you wanna monitor your heart, and it would be a good thing, and Paul's trying to get you to do that here, you should know and apply, he says, what love is. In fact, you could add to that in your uh, write down, what love does. There, there's a danger if you say, I know what love is, 
and, and all of a sudden you stop there and you're not able to apply it to life. In, in fact, it would be more dangerous to know what love is and not apply it than to not understand what love is. And then one day you sort of wake up or, or God gets your attention and you realize, wow, I've been so focused on myself, so focused on what I want, so focused on trying to fulfill my desires that I've missed God's desires in my life and, and his way in my life. And all of a sudden that'd be a wake up call and it changes the way you live your life and the things that you do. You would say that would be a really good thing. But what would be a terrible thing is if you know, if you understand and you decide not to apply it because then the answer the, or the question is, so now what hope is there for me? Now what will rescue me from my own self-centeredness, from my own selfishness in life? Fourth thing is I would say this, Paul's pointing out, you need to trust God for some breakthrough moments because God is loving and caring and God certainly does try to get our attention. And because of that, God is the one who comes so many times and, and he just shocks us or he, or he says, are, are you kidding? Do you realize what you're about to lose? Or do you realize, you know, what you're about to miss in life? And we sort of wake up and go, wow, I really need a change. In fact, what I really need is for God to bring a change in my life because left on my own, th this is where I end up in life. But God has different plans. He has better plans. There's, there are these verses in a Proverbs 24. I really like them. In fact, someone should make a plaque or, or something out of wood and, and burn these verses on there. I'm, I'm saying that because there's some people in our church that do that. So you never know. They might end up doing something like that. And I will display it if, if they do. But I love these verses because these are verses to kind of hang on to in the Proverbs. Proverbs are wisdom sayings. This would be really smart to catch this and understand this. And this is what he says in Proverbs 24, beginning with verse number three. Um, it says this. A house is built, think about this, a house is built by wisdom and becomes strong through good sense. That means good common sense. You just realize this is how it works, so I need to do these things and that's what's gonna make my house strong and, and, and special, my life, my family, my marriage, strong and special. And he says in the next verse, verse four, he says through knowledge, that, that he's referring again to the wisdom and the common sense here that, that comes. He's not, he's not shifting to a new thing. Through knowledge, its rooms are filled with all sorts, catch this, all sorts of precious riches and valuable things. Wow, yeah. But it takes some wisdom to, to get those things and some wisdom to focus on those things and wisdom to sort of turn away from the things that we naturally turn to and we are naturally oriented to, it to in order to look at the things that really matter and, and really make sense that those are the things that will last forever. The other are just temporary things, things that you do wear down to, that you get tired of, that you say, do we have to do this again? Just, you know, and, and then there are things that those things are supposed to reflect or point to that matter and that, that count in life. Let me give you a fifth thing that I think as far as a heart monitor is concerned is understand that God wants to change your mindset. And, and that's key as far as your heart is concerned, how you think, how you see things, how you understand things. In fact, Paul says in the book of Romans, that's the whole point of God giving us his spirit so that our mindset, the way we see things would be very different. This is what uh, Paul writes in Romans chapter number eight. It's not gonna pop up on your screen, but if you wanna write this down, uh, Romans chapter number eight, this is what he says beginning with verse five. He says, for those who are according to the flesh, that means they only see things the way human beings see things before God invades their life and fills them with a new spirit, a new way of seeing things. He says, for those who are, who are according to the flesh, they set their minds on the things of the flesh, the old way of seeing things. But those who are according to the spirit, the things of the spirit, they set their minds on the things of the spirit, God's way of seeing things. Verse six, he says, for the mind set on the flesh, catch this, is death. Yeah, it, it doesn't last. It, it will die, it will go away. You, you've, you've sold out for some temporary things rather than using temporary things to purchase things that last forever. He says, but the mind set on the spirit is life and peace because the mindset on the flesh is hostile 
toward God, for it does not subject itself to the law of God, it is not even able to do so. And those who are in the flesh cannot please God. However, I love this. He's saying to them, however, since you're believers, he says, uh, you're not in the flesh, but you're in the spirit. If indeed the spirit of God dwells in you, but if anyone does not have the spirit of Christ, he does not belong to him. Because when, uh, when you give your heart to Jesus, when you say, listen, I trust you, I want to follow you, I want to know you, it is one of the things that, that he does is he gives us his spirit to live inside of us. He teaches us a different way to live, a different way to see life. Yes, he teaches us a different way to love because he knows without him teaching us what love is really all about, uh, we would waste our lives and we would only chase after the old way of doing things. Here's what he goes on to say then uh, in 1 Corinthians, beginning in verse number 8. He says this, and he's going to kind of reiterate just what we were talking about. It's a, it's a great uh, part after his description of love where he says prophecy and speaking and unknown languages and special knowledge will become useless. That's the same thing as saying it, it will die. But love will last forever. Now, our knowledge is partial and incomplete. And even the gift of prophecy reveals only part of the whole picture. But when the full understanding comes, these partial things will become useless. They'll be, they'll be done away with. He says, when I was a child, I spoke and thought and reasoned as a child. So he's, he's kind of referred to his own life that we all understand. You saw things a certain way. Um, you may have viewed things even like love in a certain way because all of us, when we were young, we thought we knew it all. We've got it. We figured it out. No one's going to tell us any different. Oh, no. We're, and, and a lot of times our youthful passion seems to be the proof that what we say is right until we grow up. And then all of a sudden we realize, okay, maybe I was foolish uh, back then. And that's kind of what he's, he's pointing to with, with all of us is true. He says, when I was a child, I spoke and thought and reasoned as a child. But when I grew up, I put, childish, I put away childish things. Now we see things imperfectly as in a cloudy mirror. But then we will see everything with perfect clarity. All that I know now is partial and incomplete, but then I will know everything completely just as God knows me completely. You know, that's, that's Paul again pointing to the fact God is moving you toward maturity. God is the one who's trying to help you grow up. Growing up is not a bad thing. It can be a wonderful thing. But it does mean, you know, changing the way you see some things, changing your views and changing your priorities in life and saying, here's what's most important. Here's what's going to last. I'm going to put my emphasis and my efforts into those things. Why would I not do that? Why would I just put them in, in temporary things? There's that change that occurs. And then in verse 13, he says, three things will last forever, faith, hope, love. But we all know the verse, but the greatest of these is is love. In fact, the ne very next chapter uh, that, that Paul writes in this letter, the first two words in, in the chapter, he says this, pursue love, this kind of love. Yeah, that's what you chase after and what you work for, because it's not only a gift from God, but this is something that you were a part of in learning, in chasing after, in allowing God to teach you these things and allowing God to uh, to build you up. So here's the question I would leave you with. Um, can you improve and strengthen your marriage? In fact, you could do this with any relationship, friendships, all sorts of relationships. Can you make them better? Can you improve them? And can you strengthen them? Because it's very easy to chase after things that don't work and they're not going to last. And you keep chasing after them, trying to make them work and trying to go to some other, you know, idea of what will, what will work in your life and just being frustrated and frustrated and frustrated and just giving up at some point and not believing that there's a change that it can occur. And something that as we grow older and we mature, that can become much more powerful and much more special in our lives than just the temporary things that we left behind. See, I think the answer is absolutely yes. But it does come with a price. In, in order to grow up, you have to walk away from childish things, even childish ideas, so that you can move on to mature things, better things, things that are that are uh, going to last. And, and the truth is, uh, not everyone will do it. Not everyone will decide to chase 
after those things because not everyone is, can come to grips with the price that they have to pay to just let go of those old things. But you can, and God can move your heart and God can renew your heart and God can bring new strength and new love and vitality and new passion to your heart for things that last forever to replace the passion or the desires that you had uh, before in those, uh, in those old days. You just have to uh, be willing to let go. Now, a lot of people can't. A lot of people struggle with it. In fact, I see this in relationships all the time where someone comes in and uh, you're trying to help them, you're trying to counsel with them, and, and the one, one of them is just bent on, we cannot reconcile, we cannot find a new love until that other person admits that I am right and that my way is right. Then it's, it's dead in the water. Because this is always a yielding of two people to God in his way. Not saying everyone has to yield to my way. And I, I've seen this over and over again in, in marriage counseling, where I will bring what I think is the most important thing that you can do if you want to rebuild any relationship, especially in a marriage. Here's the most important thing you can do. And I always ask this, can you be patient and kind? Well, I uh, no. Can you be patient and kind? Can you show patience and kindness to the other person? Because if you say, yes, I can do that, and you are willing to do that, listen, your heart can be renewed. Your heart can be revitalized. It, it, it is a sacrifice. You're giving up some other things. You might have to let go of wanting to be right always and realize that this is more important than wanting to be right always. You may have to give up your list that you've been keeping. This is some of the things that Paul says of the things that you have been wronged in in order for your heart to be filled with a new life and a new vitality in this relationship. Can you be patient and kind? I know it sounds very simple. Uh, I know that you might look at it and say, well, I mean, that's just, you're just being practical. Oh yeah, that's exactly what I'm doing. Because it is in that practicality that the mind shifts and that eventually once the mind shifts toward that person, I'm, I'm gonna be patient toward them. I'm gonna, I'm gonna be kind toward them. This is showing and demonstrating real love to them that all of a sudden over time, the emotions, the feelings also shift toward them in favor of them, not away from them. And here's the really wonderful thing. If, if you will do these things, if you will be patient and kind and you will put this into practice and you will decide, Lord, give me help, give me strength so that whenever I'm tempted not to do these things, that I will stop and think and still act in this way, knowing this is the future. The, these are the things that matter and that last. That's what 1 Corinthians 13 is all about. If you will do those things, not only can your heart change, but this is the way you change someone else's heart. The, the kindness and patience is the thing that melts the heart eventually. You, you can't do it just one time in one moment in one day and think it will change everything. But over time, patience and kindness melts away. Patience and kindness takes down the defensiveness, the walls, the barriers between two people. And, and, and it, it doesn't mean that the, the past offenses you know, didn't happen, but it means you have a way to overcome those past offenses, to find forgiveness and to find healing in any relationship. We're going to talk a little bit more about that uh, next Sunday. Uh, I hope that you will join in because uh, there's more application because you may think, I'm not sure I can do that. But next Sunday, we're going to talk about it, how you do that, how you put these things into practice. And, uh, but right now, would you just pray with me? And dear Heavenly Father, we do uh, thank you that you have a way. Um, you are the, the great way maker for us, the healer for us, the one who uh, understands us. You made us. You know what we're wired for. Uh, you know what works in our lives. And so, Lord, we are so grateful that, that you want to give us the things that work, that Jesus Christ came to give his life to prove how much he loved us, and Jesus exercised incredible kindness and patience as you have, Father, with us as your sometimes foolish and rebellious creations. 
So Father, forgive us of our sins. Fill us with a new spirit, the spirit that Jesus came to give, to equip us to live together, to love one another, to care well for one another, and that our lives would not be the way they always were, but our lives could become what you wanted them to be. If you're listening and you've never given your heart to Jesus Christ, this is an act of submission to him, of surrender, knowing that it is only his love and his forgiveness that can save you, that can rescue you. And it is only the love of Jesus Christ that can save you and rescue you. And then the bonus of that is he gives to those who yield to him and who look to him and put their hope and trust in him. He gives to them a new spirit to rework them on the inside, to make them into new people, better people, the people, the men and the women that God designed us to be. So you could open up your heart right now and say, Lord Jesus, forgive me my sins. Forgive me my foolishness, only wanting what I want, trying to make life my way. And because of it, Lord, becoming blind to the people that matter around me, the people that are most important, should be the most important. Lord, how foolish I feel looking back at the way I've lived so many times. But would you come and would you forgive me? Cleanse me, make me new, make me into the person you want me to be. Lord, yes, fill me with a new spirit, your spirit that the spirit of Jesus would live inside of me because I look at how you lived, what a wonderful way to live. What incredible results you had, what a life. Lord, give me that kind of life living inside of me. In Jesus' name I pray, amen.